Um, so can everyone see my screen? Yes, great. All Perfect. right. All right, well, well thanks everyone uh, for uh, allowing us to speak today. We are very excited uh, to have this opportunity uh, to explain um, our practice uh, wh and what we do and the latest updates in, in brachytherapy uh, and to show you how you know th this is really a, an ideal option that needs to be available to everyone, uh, including the veterans. Uh, <clears throat> get, to introduce our practice, uh, it's the Prostate Cancer Institute of America. It was actually only founded just 2022. And the mission is really to provide uh, LDR, low-dose rate prostate brachytherapy services to the communities across the United States in a collaborative manner with uh, interested urologists or urology groups uh, to be able to provide this modality that went away for the wrong reasons. And, you know, and really, the only, it's the only practice of its kind where we solely dedicate ourselves to low-dose rate brachytherapy that allows us to be able to perform this because this is a very highly operator-dependent procedure. Um, and therefore, by us focusing exclusively on this procedure, we're able to be able to provide the best care. Uh, and this is my myself. I want to introduce is Dr. Uh, Ajay Bhatnagar. I went to medical school at, at University of Pittsburgh and did residency there. Uh, I've greater than 20 years experience in low-dose rate, low rate brachytherapy. Um, I'm the founder of the Prostate Cancer Institute of America, actually originally started in Arizona. And I'm currently, this is all what I'm doing, is practicing uh, LDR brachytherapy, doing cases every day. Tomorrow, I uh, have a bunch of cases and every week. Uh, and so it's a very unique model that I've created that we would now like to expand across the network, which is why now I've had uh, partners, including what, such as Dr. Manuj Agarwal, uh, who will be helping expand the East Coast, uh, being based in the Philadelphia area with his roots from New York. Uh, he's actually a brachytherapy fellowship trainee um, and with many years of experience and a nationally recognized GU expert uh, and previously uh, the medical director at the University of Pennsylvania site, but is now, um, <clears throat> been a, has now left that to join this new exciting uh, practice. Of, of one of a kind. Uh, Dr. Konaru uh, also has many years of uh, brachytherapy experience and is based in Iowa and will be helping to expand the Midwest. So between myself and the West Coast, Dr. Argo on the East Coast, and Dr. Canero in the Midwest, we're hoping to be able to really be able to start the initial uh, um, ex expansion across the United States to be able to make this treatment available again. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we, we actually would love to be able to uh, start a fellowship to create more, to gain more people that are actively trained in this procedure to make it more available. But uh, we believe this is a good, healthy start. Uh, you know, the current locations are, are in Arizona where I'm based um, and been there since the last two years. Uh, also in California, in Colorado, Nevada, uh, also in New Mexico, in Iowa, where Dr. Um, Canero is, and now starting in the East Coast with Dr. Agarwal in, in Pennsylvania and New York very shortly. So very, very excited about what we're able to do here. And, and so in terms of low-dose rate brachytherapy, let's remind ourselves what this is here. And this is really the most conformal radiation treatment for localized prostate cancer. Uh, and we'll go over this, but really there's an abundant amount of literature to support its use over the modalities. And it's also the most cost-effective treatment for localized prostate cancer, which is why, quite frankly, it became it has become extinct. Uh, you know, you know, and it's unfortunate, but the, you know, that's really uh, the beginning uh, of the problem, uh, which I'll show on my next slide, is that you know, when, which is why I tell everyone the story of low dose rate brachytherapy represents exactly what's wrong in our American healthcare system. Where here we have a very cost effective treatment, which is exactly why no one does it anymore. Uh, with the emerge, given the use of other uh, more lucrative treatments that become available, but the problem mm -hmm. has become bigger than that. It's not even due to the financial 
uh, reasons, but also the ability. Now, there's there's very few people even trained. It's it's very highly operator dependent, uh, and now there's now is very little training even now available. Um, and then also uh, logistically, it is very hard for a radiation oncologist to have a busy external beam practice and a busy brachytherapy practice. You, it's not possible to be in two places at the same time. So, you know, now with the, the physician supervision rules being much more strict in terms of being present uh, in the clinic when the external beam radiation is being delivered, uh, it makes it very difficult to go to the operating room uh, to do brachytherapy while if you already have um, uh, busy external beam practice. That's actually why I left. Uh, uh, and so our practice has no responsibilities for external beam radiation therapy um, that allows us uh, the ability, the freedom to actually uh, exclusively focus on brachytherapy. It also gives us not only the time, but also the financial freedom. You know, with, you know, the external beam radiation therapy is, is a very expensive modality with significant costs. And like I said, with low dose brachytherapy, the, it's cost effective. And so therefore for our practice, in order to be viable, we have leveraged those advantages. So we don't have expensive equipment. We, we don't have expensive staff. We actually don't even really have offices. I, I mainly provide virtual health. I have an office in Phoenix, but actually uh, it's only just subleasing. So, you know, we're, we're really leveraging the, the unique advantages as well as the, the, uh, the uh, emergence of virtual health to be able to leverage this as a, a, a viable financial, viable, a financially viable practice uh, to be able to offer the most cost-effective treatment. As you can see here, the slide here really says it all. Uh, it's a, it's a pra it was a, this is a big uh, article in the Brachytherapy Journal just published two years ago showing, you know, the death of brachytherapy since 2007 and the emergence of IMRT since that. And, you know, the, 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 the numbers beside itself showing the reimbursement for each of the procedures basically explain why. Um, and so, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the irony is while there has been a death of this treatment, there have there has been an emergence of excellent modern techniques to practice LDR brachytherapy, provide better dose coverage, provide better sparing. And there's been a, an emergence of some really strong data to support the use of brachytherapy. Uh, this, so it really is ironic and doesn't even make sense. Uh, of what's happened when we when we look at uh, this, and we're going to go more into this uh, uh, of the modern brachytherapy in terms of its advances of technology, as well as the emergence of really solid data that Dr. Agarwal is going to present. So, in terms of modern LDR brachytherapy, you know, <clears throat> three major attributes that I feel have made this a much better technology than before. First is real-time brachytherapy planning. And what this is, is allow is an ability for us to create a brachytherapy plan right at the operating room, real-time, based on the imaging and ultrasound of the prostate at that moment to provide the most accurate and precise plan. Historically, we would use pre-plan, where we would create a brachytherapy plan on preoperative images, and then use that plan to deliver the treatment in that operating room. But that doesn't always work so well because during, for multiple reasons, you know, uh, there could be a, quite a big bit of a delay from the preoperative images to the real time OR date. And while this patient is on androgen deprivation therapy, there could be a big reduction in the size of the prostate that could lead to a much different plan that would be optimal. Also, the you know the positioning and the size of, of the ultrasound of the prostate could also not exactly be the same positioning as it was preoperatively and therefore really not match. So for multiple reasons, a preoperative plan isn't really ideal. The real-time imaging, the real-time plan, the real-time brachytherapy planning really allows for an optimal customized plan. People used to uh, uh, worry that it would take too long to do this, 
But with experience, it is actually not that long at all. And now there's new AI mediated dose optimization modules in these softwares that can allow us to do it in seconds. And so it, that really is no longer an excuse not to do real-time brachytherapy planning, especially with these optimization modules that allow for experienced users to do these plans in seconds. So uh, it, it's really a, a major advance. Another advancement, as we all know, is the advancement in imaging of prostate cancer. Uh, we, we, I think uh, the MRI and the PSMA scans have significantly enhanced our ability to identify specific tumors within the prostate. And we are now able to use those imaging modalities into our brachytherapy planning software to be able to make sure we target these specific lesions, uh, either focally in focal brachytherapy, which is, I believe, the future, um, but also to be able to do that in our current plans where we're treating the whole gland to make sure we're boosting these areas that are of involvement. So uh, the, the, the utilization and the ability to fuse this, the advanced imaging techniques is a significant advancement. And then there's rectal spacing. Uh, and again, this is uh, not just for prostate brachytherapy, but for any prostate radiation modalities. You know, the, the implantation of this biodegradable material in between the den NVA's fascia to space the prostate from the rectum uh, allows us now to deliver brachytherapy very safely, uh, especially in those settings where patients have combination therapy with brachytherapy and external beam, where the major criticism or uh, risk was rectal toxicity, but that's no longer an issue uh, because of the use of rectal spacing. And I'll show you here how rectal spacing is nicely combined with brachytherapy since these are both techniques that are done under transrectal ultrasound guidance through transperineal needles. And so therefore, it's quite easy to do these two procedures concurrently at the same time without any significant more time. So here is uh, me in the OR showing a, a brachytherapy plan. I'm actually um, trying to uh, uh, create a plan where I'm placing the needles within the periphery of the prostate to create what we call a peripheral loaded technique in order for us to adequately spare the urethra, that green circle in the middle. So here um, you can see I'm in the operating room creating what I <laughs> an optimal plan, uh, delineating where the needles need to be. And then I can actually uh, up implement the volume optimization technique. And then in seconds, come up with a plan where the needle or the seeds are appropriately placed in those certain needles to create an optimal plan of covering the dose to the target, the prostate, while adequately sparing the urethra and rectum. The rectum is not as much of an issue anymore with spacing. It's mainly the urethra uh, sparing. In terms of image fusion uh, incorporated into brachytherapy, I can now show you here uh, a, a specific uh, case where this patient had a recurrence uh, identified by PSMA and MRI. And so using this information where you can see the posterior border of the prostate is lighting up as well as having darkness on the MRI correlating to this lesion here that was biopsy proven. Um, we can now incorporate that into the ultrasound for brachytherapy planning and to then allow us to create an appropriate brachytherapy plan with the appropriate implantation of the seeds and needles to cover this target that was delineated from the original PSMA and MRI imaging. And so this now allows us to really give us the ability to give focal treatment. Uh, and, and so that can be used in the salvage setting or in the de novo setting as we talk about focal therapy, like you've heard of Haifu or um, sauna blades or nano knife, uh, an actual, uh, another uh, cost effective way to provide focal therapy is focal brachytherapy, as I could show here. And so, uh, with the ability to fuse 
these images were able to provide a, a cost-effective way for salvage therapy as well as de novo focal therapy. And then, of course, there's rectal spacing. Um, probably have heard about this before, um, but to be able to uh, implant this bear gel or spacer uh, in between the prostate and rectum uh, allows us to give a brachytherapy, especially in these salvage settings that have already received radiation uh, and failed rate external beam radiation and deliver uh, the, an adequate dose, especially to that posterior border around that rectal wall. We no longer have to, we can uh, be generous and no longer have to worry about uh, inadequate coverage of that area because of the ability to have rectal spacing. Um, and, and one thing, I, as you can see here, I, I actually perform this at the same time of breaking therapy, which really is a nice convenience for these patients that, you know, they basically get like a, a two for one special where they not only get the seeds placed, but then they also have this uh, bear gel space, as you can see that black area. Um, and so it's, it's a, another cost savings uh, from, from a time perspective and other ways to have this procedure done simultaneously. And a nice convenience for the patients too, that have only one time uh, go to sleep and then wake up and get you know both of these procedures at once. I'm gonna leave it here for Dr. Agarwal uh, to speak about uh, the, the, the latest literature. Thanks, Dr. Bernagar. Um, I think, you know, Dr. Bernagar gave a really nice overview of the practical aspects of brachytherapy. And those aspects can be applied in the monotherapy setting in which brachytherapy is used alone, and also can be used in the boost setting where radiation is used in conjunction with external beam radiation. Uh, what you see here, image uh, pictured on the left, is straight, it's taken straight from the NCCN guidelines. So we, we stratify prostate cancer based on risk groups. Within intermediate risk, we've got favorable and unfavorable, and then within high, you have high and very high. And really the boost setting occurs within that blue area that I've highlighted, but really the, the, the biggest bang for your buck comes for high risk. When you look here on the right side, again, this is taken from the NCCN guidelines in terms of the recommendations for initial therapy. And you see on the top, You've got ABRT or external beam radiation and brachytherapy is one of the preferred options. Oh, Jake, can you next slide, please? Um, so for intermediate risk prostate cancer, there was a trial that was conducted um, several years ago. It got published last year by uh, Jeff Mikowski. This trial took patients who had intermediate risk disease, about almost 600 uh, patients, and were randomized to get either external beam and an LDR implant or LDR alone. And the data now is tracked out to 10 years, but essentially um, at the five year and all the years up until 10, they saw absolutely no difference with the combination approach for patients who have intermediate risk disease. Uh, there was no difference in terms of failure free survival, but there was more toxicity as you'd expect from applying the two modalities instead of one. Uh, there was more side effects if we did both. The outcome, the takeaway from this trial was that men who have intermediate risk prostate cancer can get an implant alone. There's no benefit to doing combination therapy whatsoever, and this remains uh, standard of care. Next slide. The ASCENDRT trial, and this was a, a, a pretty landmark trial that was published several years ago. This trial took several hundred men were mostly NCCN high risk, although there was a population who had uh, unfavorable intermediate risk. And they were randomized, similar to the prior study, except that since this was high risk, all men received hormone therapy. The first arm got modern radiation therapy in terms of dose, 78 gray, which is considered a modern dose of radiation. Uh, about a little over half of that was delivered to the whole pelvis, so it targeted the lymph nodes in the pelvis. And then the remainder was targeted at the prostate and the cellular vesicles. The other arm also received external beam radiation, but only received the pelvic radiation. The cone down, or the kind of the concentrated dose there afterwards, was delivered with an LDR implant. In this specific trial, they used iodine-125. There's several different isotopes that are available, and I'll go into that in a, in a, in a bit. 
And what we found, next slide, please, Andrew. So this, this is the proportion of men without biochemical failure. Essentially, what is the likelihood of cure long-term? What you see is that for the first couple of years, the curves overlap, and then they separate and they continue to separate. In fact, once you hit, a, once you hit about four years after brachytherapy, the likelihood of you failing is extremely low. Now, brachytherapy is represented by the top line. Now, for the, you know, the men in the room who are, who are not doctors, the way I present this to patients is that, you know, you want to be at as high as possible on this curve for as long as possible. So ideally, you would want to be at the 1.0 for as long as possible. So you want to be in the highest curve here, and that's what's indicating that gray curve, which is the brachytherapy curve. With the external beam curve, you see the patients continue to fail over time. There's no time point where this curve bottoms out. So after that four-year mark, if your PSA starts to climb, um, you know, you failed external beam radiation. So these curves are so wide that you could drive a truck through it. In terms of the actual numbers, uh, Jay, if you click one more time. In terms of the actual numbers here, uh, broken down the progression-free survival into five, seven, and nine years. But most men are concerned about, you know, what is my long-term likelihood of cure? Many studies only go out to five years, and it's not enough follow-up for prostate cancer. As you saw here on the curves, the curves really start to separate after the four or five year mark. So at nine years, and this child's actually published data up until 12 years, there's a 20% spread um, in terms of your likelihood of cure if you had a brachytherapy implant. This stands for a hazard ratio of two. If you flip those numbers around, the 78 and the 58, if you flip those around in terms of likelihood of failure, you know, 20, essentially 20% versus 40%, you see that the simple act of giving a brachytherapy implant increases your likelihood of cure by two. All right, next slide, please. And this benefit doesn't just apply to any high-risk patient. The benefit applies to even the worst of prostate cancers, the Gleason 9 and Gleason 10 players. Now, when you grade prostate cancer, you grade it on a score between six to 10, um, and nines and tens are the worst. And you see here for the worst prostate cancers, again, you wanna be as close to 1.0 in this curve as possible. And there's one curve here that stands out the most, and that is that blue line. And as you see in the legend, that is, those are men who receive the combination of external beam and brachytherapy. For high-risk men with Gleason 9 and 10, getting external beam with hormone therapy is inferior, and, and simply getting a prostatectomy is also inferior. And this, as you see here in the, in the, in the labels, this is for men who are, are living without prostate cancer. That's a prostate cancer-specific survival. And distant metastases, the likelihood of the cancer spreading to other parts of the body is, um, you know, is lower with brachytherapy. Essentially, by destroying all the cells in the prostate, we're decreasing the likelihood of distant metastases. Next slide. All right. And this was actually a really intriguing trial that was just published a few months ago. This came out of Japan. There was 37 centers. They took men who were mostly high risk, almost you know, about 90% of these men had high risk prostate cancer. And a number of those, 50%, had several, um, you know, had, had high risk disease. The gray group four also stands for Gleason 9 to 10. Many had very high PSAs. And some had locally advanced disease, meaning disease that broke outside the prostate locally, T3 disease. And about half of those men also had multiple high risk factors. So this was a real concentration of men who had some pretty bad prostate cancer. And what they did in this trial is every man got external beam and LDR. So we, you know, based on the on the outcomes of prior data, um, you know, the, they were, the trial investigators were astute and knew that every man should receive an LDR implant. But the randomization here wasn't whether or not to get LDR. The randomization was the hormone therapy. Uh, the men, one, one arm of the trial got only six months of hormone therapy, and the other arm got 30 months of hormone therapy. To put things into perspective, for men who have high-risk prostate cancer, we generally do recommend long-course hormone therapy, which can range from 18 months up to 36 months. Um, similar to the prior SNRT trial, most uh, all men got 45 grade of external beam. Um, they, this trial did not give nodal radiation, 
And again, they give an iodine implant um, of 110 gray. And what you see here on the right side, the top one here is uh, the likelihood of biochemical progression. The middle one is dysmetastases, and the lower one is overall survival. And these curves are superimposed. There's absolutely no difference between the outcomes of the men who receive six months versus 30 months. Now, this is a bit of a game changer because what do men hate the most about their prostate cancer treatment? It's not the radiation, it's the hormone therapy. And if we're able to decrease the likelihood of hormone therapy, we can significantly improve the quality of life of men who are getting treatment. Next slide, please. But you know, what, what was, why hasn't this taken off? In addition to everything that Dr. Banagar uh, explained, the ascendar chi trial, the first or second trial that I showed, had a higher risk of side effects. It showed that in the short term, men had more urinary side effects. As you see here on the slide, the incidence, meaning the likelihood of, of all cases happening, was higher in the men who got the prostate brachytherapy. Most of those were urinary strictures. When you look at the prevalence, which is the likelihood of it actually continue to happen, there's no statistical difference, meaning that men had an issue and they received therapy for it and the issue was taken care of. Uh, and similarly for the GI toxicity, it was numerically higher, but there was no statistical difference. Now with more modern technique, what we see on the right side of here at the slide is with modern applications, um, the, the use of advanced imaging, the use of quality assurance, uh, advanced, advanced imaging, better ultrasound equipment, um, and potentially different isotopes, the likelihood of developing a structure now is very low, uh, less than 5%. Uh, and that's been our experience as well. For, you know, for someone who's very careful and, and paying attention, the likelihood of getting a structure is very, very low. Uh, and you know, to put that into perspective, the rates are very similar to what happens after a prostatectomy. The, you know, the uh, nomenclature is a little different. They call you know, over there, it's called a stenosis. For us, it's called a stricture. But compared to men who then need radiation after prostatectomy, which occurs for many high-risk men, we saw in the prior slide that uh, you know prostatectomy was lower than the men who, uh, in terms of likelihood of prostate cancer survival, prostatectomy was inferior. Radiation, external radiation, can sometimes come out and, and give salvage therapy, but it's coming at a cost, and that cost is is fairly high. Uh, in terms of GI toxicity, as Dr. Banagar had mentioned. Uh, with the use of rectal spacing, the likelihood of developing GI toxicity is, is close to zero. The, the dose that we're getting to the rectum is, is pretty much, you know, absolutely, is not really significant anymore. Okay, next slide. And again, that's assuming a quality placement. Of course. Correct, correct. All right. So this was the same group, the Ascend RT group, which uh, you know, had the, had the higher uh, toxicity. What they did is they then changed their method of implanting patients. Um, they, as you see here, this particular study had about 100 consecutive patients, and they continued to have the same outcomes recognized here on the stars from the initial publication that I showed you. But what they found is that they only had 3% uh, of grade 3 of the, of the same side effects they had before. When the prior trial had demonstrated 18 with more modern technique, with better equipment, with better imaging, you see here at CT and MR fusion, um, department review, they're able to get their toxicity rates down to a very acceptable level. This is what high quality brachytherapy looks like. High cure rates, low toxicity. Next slide. You know, I added the slide here to talk about the forgotten toxicities. You know, we have addressed as a community, the brachytherapy community has addressed the, the side effects profile that we, um, that we just mentioned. But I mentioned that trial, the Japanese trial, that showed that we can decrease the duration of hormone therapy significantly just by doing a procedure that takes about an hour. That one hour procedure, the one hour of my time, the one hour you know, plus of the patient's time, can save them months to years of hormone therapy, which then translates to much faster testosterone recovery, right? If someone's only getting a short course versus a long course, their body is quicker to, re to recover after they're done. 
And in that Japanese trial, it took only about seven months for men to get back to their baseline testosterone. Whereas it took almost a year and a half, you know, year, three months for men with long-term to recover. Um, and, it, and the likelihood of being fully recovered was much higher. So we all kind of know what testosterone does to the body. And we also know what lack of testosterone does to the body. And the picture here on the right is kind of a, a very typical phenotype of a man who's on long-term hormone therapy. So if we can, we can potentially really uh, improve quality of life just by simply doing LDR and brachytherapy. Next slide. All right, a little bit of a blurry picture here, but I just wanna illustrate a point. So looking here at the left, this is a tumor probability uh, curve. So what we did initially where you know, the, the initial star on the left was the likelihood of control with external beam radiation. We mentioned for high-risk patients, about 60%, it was 58% on the ascend RT trial. And they went up, they increased the likelihood of control to about 80%, but they also increased toxicity. With modern techniques, the ones that we just mentioned, the incorporation of advanced imaging, better avoidance of organs at risk, uh, where you can have either acute toxicity or you can have strictures, and the addition of rectal spacing, also the potential change of isotopes. We use palladium-103, which can have a more favorable dose distribution. What we've now done is we've shifted that tissue damage curve. We've maintained the very high rates of cure, but now we've also been able to achieve the very low rates of toxicity. That makes this modality much more appealing. Next slide. All right, uh, so that was all more in the uh, context of either monotherapy for intermediate risk disease, boost therapy. What about salvage therapy? So we know that for high risk disease, you know, 40% of men are gonna fail long-term. Uh, any, any radiation oncologist, probably more urologists than radiation oncologists are very familiar with how many patients are failing external beam radiation. What do we do for these men? I'm very proud to say that this particular trial is the only trial that has prospective data, the only phase three randomized trial that looked at salvage radiation or salvage brachytherapy, salvage anything after radio recurrence. This is a trial that I actually enrolled patients in as a resident. So when I was a resident, we did implants at the VA in Brooklyn, and we got referrals from all over uh, the Northeast that funneled in to the Brooklyn VA to do implants. Um, so we had enrolled a number of patients on this trial, and we contributed to this data. Um, but I just want to throw that in there just to say that I'm, I'm familiar, at least peripherally at that time, with you know some of the referral patterns from the VA. And I think if we're able to do it then, we probably could be able to do it again. Um, this is an example here of what a focal, if you can go back, yeah, an, an example here of what a focal implant looks like. So we're able to define the image, you know, the area of recurrence on MR. Of course, this was biopsied and confirmed to just be present in that area. And we designed a focal implant that covers that area with margin. Um, you don't necessarily have to implant the whole gland. Okay. And this is uh, something that we are regularly doing in our practice. Okay. Next slide. All right. So in conclusion, as Dr. Banagar had mentioned, LD brachytherapy is the most, most conformal form of radiation therapy and is the most cost effective. Uh, there have been a number of advancements that we've applied in our practice that has even further refined um, outcomes and further decreased toxicity. And there's ongoing literature that shows greater benefits, such as the Japanese trial that I just mentioned. Unfortunately, the modality is very underutilized in, in the US. Um, and our goal here is to make it available to all men, make it available to the VA, and make it available across the U.S. I will say that, um, you know, we are joined here by Dr. David Crawford. Um, Dr. Moran was my fellowship director, who I know is a very good friend of yours, and um, is really through Dr. Moran and, uh, you know, many giants that we, you know, we stand on their shoulders. So thank you all. Thanks, doctors. I, I really appreciate it. A um, couple of questions. One is, um, so there's there's 41 radio sites of VAs that have uh, 
radiation capability. Uh, not all of them are doing uh, brachytherapy. I think there's only, she told me there's about four that are doing brachytherapies now. Um, so how do you see being able to market your capabilities or your office's capabilities to the VA? I mean, one is that we need to make sure that you're signed up in the community care network or you're under contract with those guys to get the community care referrals. Um, but then um, what do you see as the next next step? I mean, I guess just educating uh, the radiation oncologists and, and everybody else in the VAs for all these guys that are getting outsourced. Yeah, I mean, I can speak to the logistics. I think it, it highlights how challenging it is for uh, you know an external beam radiation oncologist to do implants. So my prior attending at the Brooklyn VA is still doing some implants, but the volume isn't what it was, you know, 15 years ago. Um, I, I, you know, I would propose that we could potentially, um, you know, create centers of excellence potentially within the VA, or we could work outside of the community care referral network. I'll hand that off to Dr. Bonagra to see what his thoughts yeah, are. I mean, the beauty is that this treatment is only a one-time treatment, right? We're not talking about having, you know, weeks or months of therapy. Like, like with radiation therapy. So traveling uh, to the center of, of excellence uh, for one time isn't unreal. I mean, I can tell you right now, I have patients traveling all over the country to see me uh, right now where in other areas where I'm not currently available as like just Chicago and, and uh, Atlanta. I had two brothers actually just recently uh, be treated by myself. And it really wasn't too bad. Uh, to 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 be able to do this because of the minimal downtime, you know they they have their procedure, they go home. Uh, one got one flew the next day, the other flew two days after to spend some time in warm Phoenix, sunny Phoenix. But I think with the beauty of uh, in the of this procedure being so efficient in terms of being quick with minimal downtime and, and recovery, uh, it, it allows one to be able to travel for this quite easily uh, during this ramp up phase of uh, of creating a more um uh, uh strong a stronger uh, and more equipped network um because yeah i mean right now it's uh three of us uh trying to you know man hold this but just but we're but just to get started you know it, it is is the key you know i think yeah. that's yeah. that's where i can tell you i'm i'm still currently in, in, in between two major veter vas between phoenix and tucson I'm actually very, but my current main since I've been I was in Casa Grande for many years was really the VA Tucson. So yeah. I, I'm still trying to um, find ways to work with the Phoenix VA that doesn't. They don't even have radiation uh, 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 facility. Right. So yeah, um, I we are I am contracted with TriWest, um, so that's, okay. that's that's not an issue. Uh, our facilities, all our facilities will, will be contracted with TriWest. So good. Well, yeah. on the East Coast, and you need to use Optum Serve, then it's got to be in the the community care network plan. I'll send you the the details. It's yeah. real easy to do. Yep. Do you guys? So a, a treatment question: Do you uh, treat the whole prostate every time, regardless of stage, or are you guys looking at now doing partial treatment, like or just where you see the the dark lesions, or where you see the you know the cancer that lights up with the PSMAs? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, the standard of care is to treat the whole gland, but now uh, with advancements in imaging and genetics, um, you know, and, and super saturation biopsies and motivated patients, um, you know, there there is a, a, an ability to offer focal therapy um, where we're treating only the involved areas. Uh, and so that definitely is uh, an emerging area. I do always you know, caution these patients in terms of the risk of failing outside, but uh, that's why they warrant close follow-up. As long as they're okay with warranting close follow-up, then the appropriate patients, again, defining what's appropriate for focal is, is an area of discussion, but let's just say, you know, with minimal dis appropriate patients, um, then then I'm, I'm, I'm okay with offering it. Um, and because again, if they do fail outside that area, it's quite possible and feasible to offer brachytherapy again. To, to the yeah. uh, 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 outside area. And and so, but for salvage patients um, uh, are, are doing focal therapy in terms of if they have a localized recurrence, then I commonly will do, offer that. So um, Mike, it's- Yeah, hey, Dr. Crawford, hi. Yeah, I can hear you, go ahead. Oh, good. Uh, great presentation, guys. Um, 
Just a just a l- little bit of breaky history. I that, you know I can remember getting involved with breaky with John Blasco uh, and Rogdi up in Seattle a long time ago, um, and then you mentioned uh, Brian Moran and and what has he done over twenty five thousand implants. You know, break break therapy has sort of been up and down, and um, you know, initially there was a lot of enthusiasm when the urologists were working together with Rad Onks to uh, do the procedures uh, collectively, and then it sort of got uh, that sort of broke apart, and then you know Neil Stone and this proceed stuff and everything else that happened over the years. Um, what I I think breaky therapy is a, a, a great way to treat prostate cancer and you've, you've outlined it very nicely in your presentations that both of you gave um and it, it the the data are coming out right now and you showed some of that that's really strong and you know there's there, there's been there, there are a bunch of cowboys that were doing you know radical prostatectomies and and uh claiming to be robot surgeons and then same thing with brachytherapy and i mean we've seen where People have had half the seed someplace else and the side effects. And, you know, that happens. But you're right. The, the, it is it is a good therapy. Uh, training is uh, there's a dearth of people doing them now. At Grand Rounds in Urology, we're working with the uh, Breaky Society and uh, people, you know, Oreo and that and and Pete Rossi and, and to, to ramp up the education. You hit the nail on the head about money uh in our system but that's i think that's gonna uh actually lead more people to the breaky plate because of uh if it's uh, sort of an x amount of dollars to take care of a localized prostate cancer patient but better you're better to spend it on breaky therapy um and i i mean again i'm a real believer of it that today i send, I, I send a lot of people to peter rossi um and i sent the guy that uh that uh runs circus away to him uh today and and uh, a movie producer last week and uh yeah they these people you, you that that was a very nice article you showed about about uh the high-grade prostate cancers too so you know that that i being a, i was on staff of the va part-time for 38 years mike knows that and uh that if there's something that's in demand the va will will bus you there one way or the other i mean we're, we were sending people down to texas for a while to get them and other things like that so i you know rather than trying to get everybody in the va trained i would think that the goal would be to get some centers of excellence or that where you can get people to uh come and get the get it done right and it. That's a that's an easy sales pitch to the VA too. Uh, it's besides you know one day you know one day service and you look at the 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 money that's saved from external beam and 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 robots and everything else we do. Um, it works. I think the the target that you know I've never I haven't been able to get a lot of. Um, Breaky therapists that have an interest in targeted focal therapy uh, with uh, with breaky, and uh, I I think rightfully so. You know, the the whole gland's still at risk, and I've been doing focal therapy now for two decades, and I'm starting to see a, a lot of the people after ten years come back with something on the other side or whatever. Um, it's such like you said, there's not many failures that occur after five years which is important. Uh, and so the, the morbidity of this t- treating the, the whole gland is pretty pretty low, except now if you want to give a boost to higher grade cancers and things like that, it makes sense. So I I, I think that, that we're going to see a, 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 more, a more interest in, in breaky right now if the data are out there, at least when I talk to men. I mean, I don't know. We have and in San Diego, where do I send people? Well, there used to be somebody at the university. There's there's people in the, I guess in LA and other in Orange County and things like that. But I don't know that we have anybody that's in the San Diego area that I know about. Uh, that maybe there is, but it's a matter of education and things. So I'll I'll shut up. But I'm I'm excited no, I... to listen to this, and it's uh, really uh, nice to see what what you're doing and. 
and a lot of my friends on your slides. Where, where's David Byer now? Is he in still north of Phoenix or? He's in Sedona. Is he? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we go way back, and there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of good people that have been in Breaky, and and I'm going to try to get over to see Brian, and I'm down in Florida right now. Um, he was. I haven't checked if he's down here this week, but he was down there down there last week. Uh, what a great guy! And uh, yeah, that's uh, the whole team's good. We had Peter Rossi gave a uh, a Brian Moran uh, a distinguished lectureship at our meeting last week, and you were there, Mike. Yeah, uh, I'm sure good. Good. So, yeah. I uh, what is there any challenge to the uh, the supply of the uh, the nuclear material or yeah. are there new developments coming along and is it uh you know it's no, manufactured no, that's, no, the, large the, quantity. yeah the only issue is that yeah you can't you, you can't just have a uh, schedule uh, an implant tomorrow you know one day you know i i it, it commonly takes i commonly give 10 10 to 14 days I mean, th this is an elective procedure, so it could be well planned out anyway, uh, scheduling the OR time. And so uh, I don't think that's an issue, uh, uh, having it planned. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to get seeds in, in a day, but we don't really plan this in a day. So as long as it's well planned out, um, it, there isn't an issue. Um, there's There is only a few vendors now. Um, and like Dr. Ugarwal said, uh, palladium is becoming a bit more popular. So there's a recent data that suggests it may actually have a better outcome. But for me, having that half-life of 17 days versus 60 days results in a much lower toxicity or duration of toxicity, uh, especially with these combination patients. Um, where I actually like to give the brachytherapy first uh, because I'll do the spacing at the same time and then you know get start six weeks later uh, with external beam because of the half life being 17 days. Whereas if with iodine with the half life being 60 days, it would that would work so well getting starting external beam six weeks after um, the sure. brachytherapy, and that's actually probably why. You know, many years ago, when they actually when they did do combination, they probably did external beam first and then did brachytherapy uh, for that reason. And so, um, <clears throat> there is definitely no issue with uh, getting adequate supply of the radioactive seeds. It's just finding the adequate supply of well trained and interested radiation oncologists. I do agree with Dr. Crawford that there is a, a interest coming back. Um, oh, may. What I've been noticing is that given the surgeons of ASCs uh, 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 in the urology community, whether they are owned by urology groups or uh, investors of a general ASC, um, this, this is an ideal modality um, uh, to be performed in the ASC, which is another cost savings. And uh, I, I see that, uh, I have personally seen that growth uh, growing as I'm expanding across the U.S. and uh, being invited to uh, join the ASC, to, to, to perform the procedures in their ASCs. So I, I actually do agree um, that this will grow. Um, uh, as as not only the data becomes out, but also there's new financial favorabilities uh, in the urology community to offer LDR, especially as the external beam uh, has been saturated at this point in terms of finances. Well, we we heard it today on Capitol Hill talking to Congress about uh, the cost of care, and uh, you know these are these are areas where. I think uh, the healthcare industry has just got to look at uh, how do we get our hands around, you know, this increasing cost of care and inflation and everything else going on. And uh, I, I think this is one where you'll probably see people come back to it because of the cost. I mean, it's what a third of what uh, external beam is, right? Exactly. So, yeah, no, it's good. Um, you guys, Terry, uh, any questions? Yeah, <laughs> thanks, uh, Bing. I was going to uh, make a comment. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, doctors. Uh, it was very interesting, informative tonight. Um, to put it in perspective from my personal uh, point of view, I I've got a an old friend who about 25 years ago, I think, uh, went out to Arizona to have some uh, radi radioactive seeds implanted. And I have to say, I understand why that has gone away, that 
this technology has kind of disappeared. He has been a mess for the past 25 years. He's walking around. He's still with us, happily, or uh, thankfully, but he's walking around with a, one of those bags, you know, for he's had all kinds of urinary tract problems since then. Uh, but what's reassuring and uh, encouraging here is that it seems like uh, there's uh, a new life for this particular technology uh, that can be applied uh, successfully to save people's lives. So, and, and oh, by the way, this buddy of mine is a veteran too. So, um, I, I don't, but anyway, I mean, thanks would, for tonight. It was uh, really yeah. encouraging. Yeah. I would think that the guy 25 years ago, they probably weren't using like this real time planning tools and things like that. They were just, didn't yeah. they just sort of fill up the prostate with seeds and hope for the best? Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, a lot, I mean, exactly. The, the, yeah. the, before they were doing, when this first started out, there was no ultrasound guidance even. Mm. Wow. It was really? just implantation were, uh, through the They parents. were doing that memorial, uh, you know, with through an open procedure. Lori Klotz was involved, involved with that a long time ago when they first started Whitmore. Yeah. Wow. So it, it's and good so to get the word out that this technology things. has changed and is, yeah, and is yeah. impactful and is not as expensive. That's a big deal, I think. Yeah. And I yeah. think another issue is having dedicated brachytherapists. I, I don't think we can stress this enough. You know, uh, you know, mm -hmm. when, when you, even me as a general radiation oncologist for 15 years, um, I was doing this once a month or once every couple of months compared to now in the last two years where I, I'm just doing this every day or one, every week. I mean, the, the skill set and, and, and the um, experience that is by far so much better. So, and I was, even back then when I was a part of my practice, once a month or once every, it would still be considered a, a fairly busy brachytherapist, okay? I mean, there were many others that may have just done it once a year or once every six months just to do it. And you can imagine, you know, the outcomes with that type of experience and skill set versus someone that's doing it every day. I mean, that's real, and, and because you have to realize that majority of radiation oncologists, if not, are usually overseeing external beam radiation therapy. They're, and, and even in academic areas where they're brachytherapists, they may be doing brachytherapy in other disease sites. So to, to, to just focus on LDR prostate brachytherapy like this really allows for a better outcome. Yeah, it's like the old saying, you know, do you want to go to the jack of all trades or the master of one? We like to pride ourselves and say we are the master of one. Well, that's great. I mean, I, I really appreciate the uh, the talk and and thank you for uh, going into detail with some of those study reports and that kind of thing. And that's what this was. We're trying to do a little bit new format, and I, I appreciate you guys presenting some of those uh, so that we can uh, entice it. Uh, and actually make this more meaning, meaningful for the physicians in the VA that are doing this. And I'll make sure that this gets distributed to all those guys. And uh, I'm sure uh, Maria Kelly will, will probably get back in touch with you guys to talk about how to uh, outsource, uh, you know, guys to your, to your care. So I, I think it's been, it's great. I think it was a very good, good conversation. No, thank you. You know, I, like you said, you're out in the Hill and, and everyone's talking about, um, you know, value-based care and cost of care and how we can save costs. I mean, you know, here's one right away, you know, yeah. we can do that. Uh, and and, and, and so clear. this is, this is something right away that can immediately save significant costs and the cost of prostate cancer care. But, and, and, and so, you know, that, that's the thing, you know, are we going to walk the walk or just talk the talk? Yeah, I, I get it. I hear you. Well, this is good. Hey, is, I'm only one guy. But yeah. I, it wasn't too long ago that I said to myself, if I ever got in that situation to have to have prostate cancer treatment, I would never do this <laughs> uh, based on my buddy's experience. You've changed my mind tonight, doctors. So and, thank and, you. And Terry, you know, the one thing to also be said is that, you know, even with surgery, there's sometimes some people have complications, right? It's, it's, it's maybe just a yeah. bad luck. You know, who knows? I don't want to speak for that. But to be honest with you, though, there is a bad perception of brachytherapy in many areas from many urologists mm -hmm. because of this issue of complications, because it's being performed by, you know, on radiation oncologists that don't really specialize in it because our main forte is overseeing external beam. 
you know and then obviously mm -hmm. they you know the latest advantages but but if the main thing is the user knowing even know how to use these modern uh, modern techniques but I, I can tell you mm -hmm. um i as we promote this modality we have come across quite a bit of resistance for other people's perceptions uh, of their historic um, complications that they've seen. And it takes time to, to change. So I'm glad you were able to change in what, 30 minutes. So that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a pushover though. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. He's a quick learner. That's good. <laughs> All right. No, I appreciate it. And uh, and again, thanks for uh, changing the format up a little bit and giving us the, those technical details and the study details, which uh, I think really matter when you start looking at, uh, at outcomes at the 5, 10, 12 years. I mean, it, it really starts to give it some credibility and some credence as to, you know, the benefits that come along with it. So I appreciate you doing that. That's very good. All right. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, anybody, any other round the horn? Any more comments, questions, anything? If not, then uh, we'll go ahead, Dr. Crawford. No, I wasn't going to say, I was just said no, but uh, I would echo, look at their complications with everything. Radical prostatectomies with external beam, with seeds, HDR, you name it, not doing nothing. I, I saw a guy had a ra that, that had a radical prostatectomy in quotes by a reasonably good person three or four months ago. Um, and um, PSA was going up. PET scan was positive. Something was wrong. I did a rectal exam, which a lot of people didn't do. I felt like this felt doesn't feel like it feels like normal prostate. They left half his prostate in when they did a robot. I've I've seen that happen in my career. I don't know how many times, and you know, I've seen seeds half of the time not being in the prostate or elsewhere, and you know, external beam. We've seen that. We looked at that in swag, and a lot of, half of the time, sometimes in major institutions, part of the prostate was missed. So, you know, we got a lot of quality control to do.